Next up, I would like to introduce a very special guest, Neil Hunt. Neil is the founder and chief strategy officer at Curie, a healthcare technology startup building a virtual primary care system using AI and machine learning. Prior to Curie, Neil was the chief product officer at Netflix from 1999 to 2017. Neil's team was responsible for the design, implementation, and operations of the technology at Netflix. Neil and his team pioneered and developed many of the technologies of A-B testing and iterative product development to create products used by more than one million consumers on a regular basis. And interviewing Neil will be John Lim, the vice president at Pegasus Tech Ventures. John oversees global investments and operations at Pegasus Tech Ventures and has been with the firm since 2014. Please give it up for Neil and John. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Great. Neil, thanks so much for coming to Star World Cup. Well, thanks for inviting me, and hope I'm uh, going to so entertain. We've got, we've got an audience of startups and entrepreneurs, so we are hoping to get your insights to the audience. But before we do that, I want to start with the first question to the audience. So how many of you have watched something on Netflix before? Raise your hand. <laughs> All right, I'm raising my hand. Don't be shy. <laughs> All right. When you started in 1999, you've had only a couple hundred users. And just last month, I saw that you had 148 million users on Netflix. So 20 years ago when you started, did you know that this product was going to be this big? No, I, it would be tempting to say yes, of course. And, <laughs> and we, we were anticipating the billion users that I'm sure that we're eventually going to have at, at Netflix. Um, but no, that would be false. Um, the goal then was a much less lofty goal of, of uh, let's, let's take the typical e-commerce 10 to 20 percent of the then current um, movie rental business that was um, represented by Blockbuster. Mm -hmm. So it was a, it was a, a nice billion dollar goal, um, but nothing like what we uh, were able to accomplish in the long term. Uh, there were certainly ambitions to go beyond that, but that was the kind of stake in the ground, get going, get it started. So what was your secret? Building such a great product. Building a great product. That's that's a, everybody wants to know the secret to building a great product. Well, the answer is, you can either be a great visionary like Steve Jobs, um, and the ideas for product sort of spring fully formed from your mind. Um, perhaps you would have a different version of that. But uh, um, unfortunately, yeah, I'm not a Steve Jobs, and so have to fall back on, on version two, which is let's have a strong process for creating a great product. And I would say there are sort of three components to that, three or four components to that. One is to have lots of ideas, lots of ideas, and some of them are better be good. Um, and, and for me, that was about finding the right product managers who had great ideas, and maybe some stupid ones too, um, that you could then test and explore. And we, did, we, we pioneered the term consumer science uh, to describe the methodology for finding out which ideas were good and which were bad. Um, and then uh, that involves basically building all the different ideas, um, putting them out in front of people, um, and measuring how consumers actually behave with those ideas and, and move forward from that. And then the third component is have the right metrics to evaluate um, how people are behaving. If you have the wrong metric, you're going to lead to the wrong goal. And so finding the right metric is, is really key, and it's often not at all obvious what the right metric is. Um, and at the end of that, be open to wild surprises and unexpected learnings that come from that and say, okay, what does this change? How do I, how do I interpret this test result to think about how consumers view my product, and what does that lead me to want to do next and, and build on top of that? So that's kind of the process that that we followed at Netflix that I built the team around. So maybe it was because you've had so many great ideas, but throughout your journey, you've also done some pivots and changed the products um, even after the IPO also. So uh, 
we initially started with the DVD by mail, right, in the red uh, envelopes, but then you've launched the uh, online content streaming business. Right. So what was sort of the catalyst to making that decision? And did you know that you, it was going to be a successful business? <laughs> um, so we, how many of you remember or maybe still participate in getting DVDs shipped through the US mail? Um, yeah, a few less hands than, than earlier. Well, if I'd asked that question in, in 2008, um, the answer was about, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 million subscribers receiving DVDs by mail. Now, it was pretty clear in, in, uh, in the mid-2000s um, that we were going to be able to deliver uh, videos, um, entertainment, over the internet. Um, I had plotted at that point um, the internet performance I'd had in my home for $50 to $100 a month uh, since 1984, 1983. Um, and those dots, uh, about a dozen of them with different technologies, exactly followed Moore's law. In fact, 1.99 doublings every 18 months. It was astonishing how, how precise that was. And by the way, it still continues on that Moore's law slope. Um, so it was very clear that even though delivering um, what was then four or five gigabytes of movies um, was not a viable proposition on, the, on the, the sort of bandwidths measured in kilobits, that it was going to get there and we were going to be able to do that. And so we need to figure out how to move the business in, into that role. And we spent a long time exploring. We had some false steps. We built, we built a, a box that had a disk in it so we could trickle the movies down overnight. That was a non-starter. Um, we abandoned that project when we got in. Uh, we, had, we had a round of, with three rounds of intense competition with Walmart, with Amazon, with Blockbuster. And so we focused all our energy on making sure we won those battles. Um, and many of you may remember those stories. And then we came back to, let's get the, the streaming stuff going. And, and at, at that point, we, we kind of knew that we needed to change the model. Instead of shipping the DVDs against the queue and having them at home ready to go, we were going to deliver it on demand. Um, and the sort of idea co-evolved as YouTube was beginning to happen. Um, the big challenge, though, was, was that um, buying the rights to stream is very different from buying the rights to, to rent a DVD. If you buy a DVD, if you, if you a consumer, buy a DVD um, at retail, you have the right uh, to rent that uh, 10 times for $2 and cover the cost of the DVD. So it's a, it's a very simple business to manage. But if you're trying to uh, stream a movie, you have to buy the rights from the owner, and that's incredibly expensive, measured in the tens of millions of dollars or hundreds. And so uh, you've got a fundamental shift to, to make the business different. And we ended up pivoting in that shift from movies to a focus on shows instead, because shows, it turns out, um, have a model of, of different windows, and they, they, they get sold on down the road. So we were able to access TV shows. Um, and that's meaningfully enough different uh, from DVDs that we had to think about the, different, di the business in quite a different way. Um, so lots of work around, around that shift. Um, how many of you remember um, the, the, the story of Quickster and the, the, the debacle of 2011? Zero, huh? <laughs> it's, it's a young audience. We, we, we had been public for, um, uh, I don't know, nine or 10 years at that point. Um, and the business is well established. You had 12 million subscribers. Um, it was delivering a, a nice revenue stream, uh, profitable. Um, and we were investing heavily um, in licensing um, shows and some movies for streaming. Um, but the content was so marginal at first. What we could afford to license for streaming uh, was so marginal that we couldn't charge for it. And so we added it as a layer on top of the DVD service that people were paying for. Uh, as a free extra, you get to stream some content. And the streaming content had grown and grown, and the value that we were delivering had grown and grown um, to the point where we needed to start generating some revenue from the streaming product to pay for the content we were putting on it. And, and that was a hard thing to accomplish. Um, there's there's, a, there's a, a, a big school of business literature around disruptive innovation. Um, and I think the definition that makes sense for me is, is when the audience, when the consumers, when the, when the customers are different from your current customers, you have a disruption in play. And our customers overlapped. 
But the customers who were going to consume streaming of shows were actually quite a bit different from the customers who'd been renting DVDs by mail um, in a lot of different directions. And so we needed to take what was then about 1,000 people in the company and focus them intensely on the new business, the streaming business, which made no revenue um, and, and was piggybacked as a, as a free add-on to the existing business. And so that was a hard problem. And we ended up executing it well enough to survive, but we burned, a, we burned a bunch of people along the way. And the mistake we made was not to grandfather the existing customers uh, in in some way. Um, and so we, we, we basically put a price on the streaming and separated the businesses into two different products and, and then moved forward with that. And, and we lost a lot of customers along the way. Um, and, and it was widely written up as the most stupid business move ever. <laughs> Um, up there with New Coke. Um, uh, <laughs> some of you actually remember that too. Huh? That was, that was uh, 1984, I think. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, um, we were successful at getting everybody in company focused on streaming, um, at, at putting the DVD business um, aside, um, and really building that up um, from the the, the handful of millions of people who were initial customers back in 2011 to 150 million today. Um, and so I would say, um, from an outcomes point of view, it was a successful transition, um, but it was certainly not easy in execution. So sorry, long answer, right. I've been rambling no, no, there, but it was interesting It's too. a huge yeah. risk that you took, uh, but yep. it paid off. But you didn't stop there, you've also kept on innovating. So what other innovative uh, approach did you take at Netflix to stay at the top of the board? I, 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 there are a bunch of things. Um, going international was a giant one, of course. Um, you know, we, we, we've got a, 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 a big market, but limited in the US. Um, and so going international, um, starting with Canada, which was sort of an easy one, um, it exercised uh, French language stuff for us. And then into Europe and, and uh, various countries there. And then we got tired of doing country by country, you know, two or three countries a year. And we just decided to, to do a big bang launch. Um, and we ended up launching uh, to uh, uh, the rest of the 192 and a half countries that Netflix currently serves all at once. Um, and that was kind of exciting. Um, who knows what a half a country is, by the way? Um, no guesses. Um, it, 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 the half a country that we don't serve is the Crimea. And, and the, we are allowed to serve in, in the Ukraine, so that's the, the, that's the State Department for you. Um, anyway, 192 and a half countries translating into 30, 40 lang uh, 20, 30 languages, 27, I think, when I left two years ago, um, with subtitles and dubbing where appropriate. Uh, so that was a big shift. Um, but perhaps the biggest shift and the one that generates the most, um, I think, discussion and analysis today is Netflix shift to original programming. And, and this is, the, 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 the shift from DVDs to streaming um, involved licensing other people's content, which had typically been aired somewhere else first. Um, and if it's been aired somewhere else first, you're picking up the crumbs under the table for the people who didn't watch it when it was first available, but now uh, are interested to watch it. And if you want something that's differentiated from the competition, then you need something different. Now, at the time, Netflix was kind of the only game in town. And so uh, the, the, if, if you wanted to stream, you were going to use Netflix. There wasn't an Amazon. There wasn't a, a, you know, any of the other competition out there. And so that was fine. But when we saw uh, other businesses uh, coming, following our path and building a streaming service, we realized we had to have original, exclusive content that the other business didn't have. Um, and so uh, coming up with originals and the funding model to make that work um, and the, the, the way to make the economics of that work, that was, that was interesting. And then originals make a good, a good tool to be able to attract new customers too. So it pivots the marketing to focus not on the technology, uh, but on the content and, and, and getting people to embrace uh, that new content. But it also, of course, requires raising uh, piles of money uh, to build an asset that will continue to pay back over um, you know, eight to 10 years, uh, particularly for a show that you do multiple seasons of. Each season, you refresh the audience uh, for the first season. And so 
that was kind of a really big pivot and, and deal too. So for the startup audience that we have, I see uh, as an investor, a lot of startups do succeed in bringing the initial customers to the platform for free, yep. but then have struggles on converting them to paid users. So do you have any solutions to that? How do you solve that problem? Um, I, I, think, I think many of you have, have um, played with uh, freemium products. Um, and I would, I would obviously clarify that you know, Netflix was never a, a premium thing, but we, we did explore um, how to make the free trial work best for us. And one of the surprising learnings that, that came up here was uh, just getting people to, to sign up for a free trial is hard too. Um, if you, so there's, there's the, the opt-in, opt-out question. Do you, uh, do you uh, let people take the free trial, and when they've experienced the greatness that's the product, then they give you a credit card and move on into paying membership? Um, that's one model. Um, or do you require the credit card upfront um, before they take their free trial? So you sign up for the free trial, providing your credit card on day one, um, and then at the end of the free trial, you have to opt out if you don't want to continue and pay. And so, um, not surprisingly, the opt out model, where we collect the credit card up front, we get many fewer people in the free trial. And so, you would think um, you get fewer people experiencing the goodness that's the product, and so fewer people eventually continuing on to pay. It's not the way it works. Um, what actually happens is you have a high hurdle to get people into the free trial but the number of people who continue beyond from the free trial into the paid service is dramatically higher. And so there's, there's something about not separating out points of decision. If, if the point of decision is all lumped in right up front, um, you, you've got one bar and, and you don't have several chances for the customer to balk and fail, and, and that's important. And, and there was a, a, a follow-on learning from that. Once we'd learned that the credit card up front was key, um, one of my product managers had a crazy idea. Um, what, if we, what if we ask people to give us their method of payment um, before we've let them uh, explore the store and see what kind of content we have available? Um, we said, well, that never worked. You know, people always, I mean, think about the physical retail. You always go into the store, you browse, you handle the product, you look at it, and then you make a decision and you walk out and pay for it. Um, we were asking people essentially to, to, to pay before they'd gone into the store, before they'd seen anything, and then be able to browse and choose what they wanted. And we thought that'll never work, but in fact it works quite well. Um, it, it, it gives a lot more customers um, than, the, than the, the alternative of having people um, pay at the end. And I think the, the explanation for that, I, I don't know if it's true, but a piece of the explanation is um, you, you, you avoid the problem of people getting so lost in the content that they run out of time. Um, honey, it's time for dinner. Why don't you come down? I think it kills a lot of potential sales. And so kind of collapsing it into one concentrated piece, getting people over the finish line, was one of the, the lessons that we learned there. So I, I think um, uh, hopefully there's some, some ideas and nuggets in, in watching how that kind of stuff has worked. It, it looks crazy. Um, but the testing, the A-B testing that I mentioned before, proves that that, that generates the best outcome. Great. The best Great. outcome of the ideas we've had. <laughs> so do you have any other interesting uh, lessons that you've learned at Netflix that you want to share with the audience on how they should be growing their business? Um, I, I think the, 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 the key is, is one, of, one of the keys is to, to have the right metrics to, to pay attention to. And so... Um, at Netflix, and uh, uh, running product, one of the key things is of the subscribers you have today, the members you have today, how many are gonna continue and pay us next month? And so retention is kind of a key metric. But when retention is in the high 90s, it's quite difficult uh, to move that upwards. And so retention is the gold standard, but it's not a great metric for measuring tests. A, B tests to see if your product has improved. And so then you look for what are the metrics that tear down the hierarchy that drive retention. And we lighted on uh, hours of viewing. Um, and if we can get 
a, 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 an audience has a bell curve of viewing behavior. They have, you know, some watch not very much, some watch, uh, you know, 100 hours a month. And if you can move that bell curve up um, and increase the average hours of viewing, you've delivered a better product that's likely to lead to better attention. And so that was a, a key thing that we, that we worked on. But even that's not sufficient. Moving the average hours of viewing is best accomplished by taking the people already watching 100 hours and getting them to watch 120, because that's quite easy. Um, and then you don't have to move many of them to move the average quite a lot. But that doesn't improve retention because the people watching 100 hours a month are no way going to quit next month anyway. You need the people at the bottom of the bell curve to move up. And so we, we lighted on a metric which is percent past the threshold. The threshold of 30 hours of viewing, which is median for, uh, 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 was at the time, median for the subscriber base. Uh, so normal performance is 50% of people watch at least 30 hours a month. Can we get 52% or 55% of people to watch 30 hours a month? Then you've moved the bottom of the bell curve up in a way that, that really makes a difference. And so that two-minute discussion um, is an evolution that took us several years to go through at Netflix. But figuring the right metric to choose the best ideas to develop the product forward is really a key piece. So I find it really interesting how you've had been part of the Netflix team since the early days as an early startup, and then you've taken the company public, and yeah. you've also helped the company grow significantly more after that, even more than 100x in valuation at least. And then you also have been serving on boards of two, private company, uh, two public companies. But then you have recently come started another company and <laughs> right. joined the, the journey of a startup again. So what was the reasoning for that? What's your initiative uh, that you're doing at now, the new startup, Curai? Yes, I, I joined Curai um, uh, nearly two years ago, um, uh, about 18 months ago, actually. Um, the, the, the mission um, is to deliver the world's best health care to everyone, um, which is an ambitious um, mission. Um, there's two interesting things tied up in that. The world's best healthcare um, implies that we're going to use AI and machine learning uh, to build a decision support tool uh, to help the average doctor practice as well as the best doctors. Um, and so we can deliver better quality of, of care. And everyone implies we better do it at one tenth the cost of uh, healthcare today. And we've chosen to address primary care so that we can be big and broad and impactful on the world. And uh, I, I, uh, I wanted to get back into the fray. I, I had spent a lot of time uh, delivering um, emotional joy to subscribers uh, through movies and shows. Um, and that was great, and it was fulfilling, and it was really a lot of fun to participate in a growth class like that. But I, I, sort of, I was eager to get back to uh, the, the, the beginning of trying to deliver something that was even more meaningful uh, than entertainment. And what could be more meaningful than delivering great health care to the world's population? So I, I don't know if we'll, we'll uh, uh, get to deliver on that whole goal. Um, my experience suggests that goals tend to shift and change and priorities evolve. But I think certainly starting with a big mission, a big goal is, is kind of key, and it's a lot of fun too. Um, and it's an opportunity to get back to building a great new team and thinking again about uh, developing a culture, which was such an important piece of Netflix and which will be such an important piece, I think, uh, for Curai too. So it's amazing to see how a successful person like you are continuing to follow your passion and try something new. Uh, but looking back in the past, if you could travel back in time 20 years, what would you tell yourself back then? <laughs> Is there any new advice, new tips? Would you do anything different? I, when, I, when I go back you know, probably more than 20 years and, and, and think, I, I was a technologist. And my ambition at the time was to, uh, to, to be you know, the world's best coder and to figure out how to deliver the best technology. And, and opportunities kind of came along for me that opened new doors and that, that led to a different direction. And, and I, was, I was fortunate to. Uh, to have a handful of, of second chances and new opportunities to, to, to take a path forward that opened up um, new avenues for me. 
Um, I, would, I would go back and I would encourage my younger self to say, jump at those opportunities more quickly and, and embrace the learning to, to, to pull in the new skills to be successful at those new directions too. Um, and you know, I think that uh, for me, shifting from being a head of engineering to a head of product and, and setting the product direction too was, was really a, an important move. Um, and continuing to grow and develop like that requires a continuous uh, sort of refresh of your mental processes. And so uh, I'm, I'm sure that that's not a big surprise to anyone. I would encourage myself, though, to be even more embracing of that kind of, uh, of change and, and, and new directions, new skills, new learnings. So the last question for the day, you've had an amazing journey at Netflix, and you have a great one coming up at Curai, but how do you want to be remembered at the end of the day? I, I think the, professionally, I would like to be remembered as somebody who built great teams that accomplished amazing things. Because the journey I've taken at Netflix um, is not a solo journey. It's a journey that's accomplished by a team that, that pulls together and does great things. And, and I'm proud that um, the, the, the environment we built at Netflix, I think, really encouraged individuals to perform at their best. And I, I've, I've enjoyed the, the discussions I've had pe with people since leaving Netflix about um, how the, the environment we set helped them to grow and to accomplish amazing things. And that's what I'd like to be remembered for. Perfect. Thanks so much for joining us, Neil. Uh, I hope the audience had a lot of takeaways. Uh, and again, great having you here. Uh, and Thank you. hope to uh, see your, uh, hear about your success stories at Cure right now. <laughs> I hope my, maybe in 10 years' time, I'll be here talking about the, uh, the milestones of, of we'll, Cure. We'll be we've inviting you back there. 10 years good. later then. Perfect. Thanks very Thanks much. Thanks so much, Neil. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Neil and John. We would like to give a special token of appreciation for Neil. <laughs> well, thank you. Then we have the second. Thanks very much. All right. Great. Thank you. Anyone's picture? Uh -huh.